brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village and Britain the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. All right, so this is episode number three, Neanderthals, and it's about their culture, their art, their language, their religion, and their mythology. And um, we have done this episode last week, and somehow it failed to record, so technology makes our lives better. I want to thank everybody who took part in that discussion. It was a pretty awesome discussion. Unfortunately, we have no record of it. That's why I'm doing it from home. But let us move on. First of all, I want to once again send my regards to everybody who has in one way contributed, in one way or another contributed to this episode, or whose work I'm relying on. Again, a shout goes out to Marvine. They have moved to a new platform from the previous one where they have uh, all of their previous podcasts recorded on, and that was um, everyphony.radio.ru. I'm still waiting on information about their updated um, site address. And then I want to thank a group of Russian scientists, which are from the Forum of Scientists Against Mythology. And uh, that would be Sokolov, Drobyshevsky, uh, Zhitinov, whose work I'm heavily relying on in this podcast, and also Bidroskin, who is an outstanding uh, Russian archaeologist who is in charge, who has compiled and is in charge of the mythology database of the world. But we will get to that in due time. Let me open my notes and we will get going. All right, so as far as Neanderthals go, they were very widespread species, as we have mentioned before. They ranged all the way from Spain to Palestine, to Altai, to Asia. And they even managed to occupy the island of Crete in Greece. And Crete is uh, interesting because it has never been connected to the mainland by a, any sort of a land bridge. And so in order to get there, the Neanderthals would have had to cross the sea. And they are a clear, there's clear archaeological evidence of their campsites on Crete. So that goes to show to us that they were fairly sophisticated creatures, fairly sophisticated uh, people. Also, it's interesting that we find very clear signs of a recent influx of the European Neanderthal DNA in the Altai region of Russia. So about their culture, we have a little bit more, and I guess, anthropological, um, archaeological evidence than we do about the other topics we're going to discuss here. First of all, there's no question that Neanderthals were definitely capable of using fire, you know, but there is some debate among scientists that maybe they did not use fire quite as much as uh, the Cro-Magnon did. And for those of you who are just joining this podcast, I just want to clarify that Cro-Magnon is just an umbrella term I'm using to identify the modern humans or homo sapiens for the purpose of the podcast. It's not necessarily um, an accurate way of using that term, but it is a convenient placeholder to distinguish modern type humans from Neanderthals or for example, from the Denisovians, who in my opinion were all humans as well, just slightly different humans. And therefore they all deserve to be called humans. And that's why I'm going to distinguish our direct ancestors as cro -Magnons. So with that being said clear, Back to the use of fire. Neanderthals definitely used fire. They used it for a lot of things. They used it for their industries. For example, um, Neanderthals were capable of very complex technologies. For a long time, it was debated whether or not Neanderthals were able to make complicated compound weapons and whether or not they were able to modify different substances for their need until a discovery was made, well, a couple of discoveries were made Fairly recently, there was a discovery made that they were able to use a glue that was made through a fairly complex chemical process, at least a complex chemical process for that period of time, um, from birch juice and from birch bark. So what they did is they acquired this birch juice and bark, and they somehow heat processed it until they made a glue that then they used to attach you know, the stone tips to their spears. And in order to make that glue, you have to put the actual substance through a fairly complex chemical process, you have to actually dig kind of a makeshift um, clay kiln or clay oven in the ground and get the substance up to fairly high temperatures. It's not an easy process 
It takes quite serious know-how even for a modern human to replicate. So th this is a fairly sophisticated uh, show of intellect and show of their ability to learn from their environment and to modify it to their needs. Um, another interesting discovery that has recently been made and that will be important here in a minute is the discovery of the um, fibers of twisted fibers of some sort of a rope or thread or twine that they had made that were also left on the residue of uh, stone weapons that the same thing this twine was used to attach the tip of the weapon to this basically to its handle so it is now known and it's proven beyond sh a shadow of a doubt that neanderthals were able to basically make woven items whether that be baskets or some some sort of sleeping uh, carpets or you know mats whether or not they used this for the purpose of making clothing um, that's up for debate but the fact that they had this technology, they were able to take plant fibers, just like you know, the modern humans can, and actually weave them into a rope or twine, that's a fairly sophisticated industry. So as far as fire goes, they, as I said, these were very uh, sophisticated people. Uh, they were people who had a dentition that is not that different from modern humans, in the sense that the teeth of the modern humans and the teeth of the Neanderthals they are not designed for tearing into raw meat. They are not designed for being able to chew and easily process raw meat. I mean, these are primates just don't have those kind of predatory teeth. Another thing is that their digestive system undoubtedly was not as well adapted to um, digesting raw meat as let's say wolves or tigers. Even though Neanderthals were the most carnivorous of all the human species, and even though even modern hunter-gatherers, or not even just hunter-gatherers, just regular hunters, are able to process and eat raw meat, I mean, there's only so much of it that a body, a human body can process. And these were very active individuals who lived in very cold environments at times, and who required quite a bit of energy, of calories to, to sustain themselves. And also they had very large brains, even larger than the modern human brains, I mean, their brains, you know, sometimes top 1600. And um, so for an individual, for a creature with such a larger brain, they really need to be able to have some sort of fuel, some sort of food sustenance for the brain to, in order for it to continue to function. So when you cook food, it becomes kind of pre-digested. It's a lot easier to process for the body. And meat in general is the most calorie um, capable, the most calorie and the energy efficient kind of food. That's why predators on average are more intelligent, more alert than, um, you know, than the grazing animals tend to, to be. And it is something that the Neanderthals definitely would have utilized. Now, we don't know how they may have cooked their food. There's less evidence or rather less instances of evidence of fire use from Neanderthal camps. But again, Neanderthals were very sparse and there are other ways of cooking your food. I mean, one can salt it, one can dry it, one can process it in a number of other ways. Um, there was some suggestion, for example, that the modern humans may have used hot spring water in order to boil their meat. I don't see any reason why Neanderthals could have not done it in the same way. So even though the evidence shows a little bit less use of fire, you no know, archeological evidence than the modern humans, again, that is circumstantial evidence. They definitely would have had to use fire in order to process, process their food, both plant matter and any sort of meat, calorie matter, in order to be able to sustain their lifestyle and their large bulky bodies. Regarding Neanderthal clothing, I mean, it is obvious that Neanderthals had it. No hominid species can survive in the extreme ar Arctic conditions that Neanderthals often had to face without having some sort of covering. And even though they were very well adapted for the cold, I find it very difficult to believe that they would have been able to do uh, it so in the very cold temperatures that they often faced without having some sort of a tactic for warming themselves. And clothing, of course, is one of those tactics. It is my personal belief that Neanderthals were probably the first humans who have uh, started using pelts and furs to make warm clothing out of just because of the climates that they lived in once again, they were very unforgiving. And we know that Neanderthals, in fact, had clothing for two reasons. One of those being that needles and, I guess for lack of a better term, pokers have been found that are associated with Neanderthal sites and um, were obviously made for making holes in some sort of a leather or some sort of a pelt. And we know, as I've mentioned above, that the Neanderthals actually were able to make twine. So they were definitely able to connect those pieces of um, 
fur those pelts together into some sort of a warming clothing type material. Another reason we know that Neanderthals actually had clothing are lice. Now, I'm sure everybody knows that, you know, the sexually transmitted thing that most people call crabs, they're actually kind of a lice that humans picked up from some sort of gorilla type relative a very long time ago, and that have adapted to live on that particular part of the human body. But there are two other kinds of lice that live on people. You know, they're the regular body lice, which most animals have. But then there's also the lice that are adapted to living exclusively on the clothing. They actually have evolved for that particular form of human self-adornment. And um, because we have finds of those uh, lice associated with Neanderthal sites, we know that Neanderthals definitely wore clothing and that the lice were just as adapted to live on them as they were on the Cro-Magnon population. Um, so the next subject is the social structure. Um, again, archaeology shows us that um, Neanderthals lived in smaller groups than even the early um, Cro-Magnon population did. Their groups on average was no more than five adult individuals and a couple of kids. That's a very small unit. Um, they show that they had, just genetic studies show that they had more interbreeding within the group simply because finding mate in a situation where, where you live in a very small collective and you're very far dispersed across a very harsh environment is uh, might be a little bit problematic. You know, the surrounding small groups may not have a mate of, of appropriate age of appropriate sort of, um, you know, sex for you to be able to take as a partner. They definitely did swap partners between groups and that's something that most animals tend to do when they given basically choice to go with instinct, but there was more inbreeding. Now, another thing that we see about Neanderthals is that they had quite a bit more of gender equality than uh, the Cro-Magnon population did because both males and females actively participated in, in the hunting, all of their hunting undertakings, and also did the children. So, and we can see that from the trauma on the bones of the, you know, of the individuals that have been found, and also from the tear and wear and signs of arthritis, which is even found on very young children, children as young as, you know, five, six years old, which goes to show that these kids and that the women and their groups were actively participating in all the activities, whether it was hunting, whether it was warfare, well, I guess conflict at that time, it would have not been really warfare. I'm sure the intensity was no lesser than that. Um, but yeah, and there seemed to be, to, seems to have been less of a division of labor. And I think I have a personal theory for that. I, I think that um, with the environment that they were in, they were more heavily relying on the animal food, on the protein kind of diet. And in that situation, when you have a lot less gathering of the plant matter, even though they did um, eat quite a bit of plant matter, you know, tubulars and other plant resources, just like cro did, but their diet was shifted a little bit towards the meat diet. And with the meat, you have a lot, of the, a lot less of the function of the, of the gathering that is usually performed by the females in the group. And so, and plus when you have a smaller group, it's really harder to assign any individuals from that group to a particular task. So regardless, they were very gender equal aware creatures and that is um, maybe something we should all aspire for. All right, so next, um, I'm gonna skip that little point, I'm gonna go back to it. Now, uh, there are signs of violence. Um, there's a 40,000 year old Neanderthal skull uh, from Cesare, uh, Saint Cesare, that has clear signs of a healed fracture that was clearly you know, delivered with some sort of a blunt or basically, blunt, sorry, some sort of a sharp instrument suggesting an interpersonal violence. I mean, it was obviously one individual clubbing the other one, up, you know, upside the head, maybe with a ax or some sort of other hunting intended object. And that's not surprising because when you have people living and again in small groups and you have a, strange groups come across each other, we see that again, even in the animal kingdom, you know, strangers are usually seen as enemies and enemies should be driven out. They should be taken with much caution. And unless the circumstances are very beneficial for that meeting to go well, there's a good chance that it's going to end up in conflict. Um, and another thing that I just skipped was is the factor of sensory deprivation. Uh, Neanderthals before the Cro-Magnons arrived lived in very small communities in a very harsh environment and they did not have a lot of a chance to interact with large crowds of other people. So any stranger that would have been introduced to their group would have definitely been a very novel and also very um, irritating factor. I, I believe that their culture was in general a little bit, this is again my own personal theory, just going 
on the evidence that we see from the archaeological uh, finds is that um, Neanderthals were probably more closed off society. They were probably more um, kind of tougher society, less carnival in a way, less noisy than um, the Cro-Magnons who tended to travel in larger groups and came from a land of plenty where they had the luxury of spending their time and their energy on uh, pursuing various things like song, dance, and other noisy activities. Now, we don't know whether or not Neanderthals had those, but there's a good chance that they did to some degree. And of course, there's the subject of cannibalism. Um, there have been several finds that clearly show that there was cannibalism going on among the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons as well. But peoples have always eaten each other and they always will eat each other. So I don't think that that's necessarily a trait that is unique to the Neanderthals. Um, one of the finds, for example, uh, you know, is a, a situation where a whole family has been butchered, clearly butchered and eaten. I mean, even their bones were cracked to get at the bone marrow. And there were children, there were three teenagers, there were six adults in this family group that got slaughtered and ate, eaten. Um, but it shows, you know, some evidence shows that this attack may have happened between neighboring or maybe, you know, strange to each other Neanderthal groups in the winter time where food would have been scarce and we know even from semi-modern human accounts that when in time of famine, people will resort to cannibalism. You know, and cannibalism is so prevalent in the human culture. I just was listening to another podcast and I kind of heard an interesting story told by the French anthropologists, um, you know, at basically the turn of the century before last, like somewhere in the 19th century. Um, actually, I'm lying. World War I, so it would have been beginning of the 20th, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th. Anyway, you know that this is when World War I was raging in Europe and of course all the European society was absolutely shocked at the number of the dead and the number of the losses that all parties involved in that conflict were suffering. It was the worst war at that time in the history of humanity. And so the anthropologists who have traveled to the island of Papua New Guinea were talking to some locals and they were very, you know, they were in shock from this conflict taking place. And so they shared the stories of this horrible war where it's, you know, thousands, thousands, millions of people were dying. And the local tribesmen who, you know, they do practice uh, both, they did practice at the time of this, you know, of this story taking place. They, I assume they don't anymore. Um, but anyway, the local, um, you know, the local Aborigines basically um, asked them, well, was that many dead? You know, how do you manage to eat them all? And when the French anthropologists told the locals that, you know, we don't eat our dead, the locals were absolutely outraged um, because to them, they, they could not believe the cruelty, the wastefulness, and the just horror of a war where you're going to kill your enemies and not even bother to eat them. To them, that was the epitome of evil. That was the most horrific behavior a human being and wasteful behavior a human being could actually engage in. So cannibalism has different angles to it, and it has always been prevalent in our culture. All right, so as far as language goes, now we all know that we're dealing right now with the issue of um, racial tensions in the world and that there's a lot of difficulty uh, finding common ground between people of different, you know, different social groups of different populations of racial um, self-identification and um, identity and also just, you know, skin color. And I think that is a very, very sad fact because the humans that are living today, as I have said before, they're all very closely related to you. I mean, well, to you too, but very closely related to each other. I mean, the actual um, genetic differences between all the people living in the world today, no matter how different they look, are just, they're minute. And we're having a hard time finding common ground and being able to talk to each other. Now, when the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthals and the, the, the sorry, Denisovians met for the first time, they didn't just look different from each other. They had different genetic code. They have been separated by thousands and thousands and you know, tens of thousands of years from each other. Their languages were so vastly different. They were not different like our languages are today. They were different in the sense that actually their throat, you know, their um, anatomy of their ear was different from each other. So the sounds they could actually make, physically make, and sounds that they could hear were different from what the other species could produce. And even their hearing diapason was slightly different. And so for them to be able to understand each other, to learn each other's language was very, very difficult, unimaginably more difficult than what we're dealing with today. 
And yet, even under those conditions, they were able to find common ground, to find uh, some sort of a compromise and be able to learn from each other, intermingle with each other, interbreed with each other, and exchange culture with each other, which, you know, is something that we are not able to do today. And that is disheartening. I think that we should all think about these ancestors that contributed so much to our culture and try to be a lot more tolerant towards anybody else, because honestly, we're not that different. Um, the interesting thing about the different sounds that the languages um, make, uh, that the languages, that the scientists think that the Neanderthal language had from the Cro-Magnon language, is that there is some debate, some scientists um, hesitantly suggest that there may be some traces left of those sounds, of those different um, vocal capabilities in the modern human languages from Neanderthals. One suggests, or from the Denisovians. One suggestion is the tonal nature of some languages in Asia, particularly the Chinese, Vietnamese, and other related languages. There's some suggestion that it, that you know, sing-song tonal quality of the language, which is fairly rare in human, modern human languages, may have been uh, something that they picked up either from their Neanderthal or their Denisovian ancestors. Another group of languages is the uh, Caucasian, some of the older Caucasian languages from the mountains of Caucasus. Now, mountains in general and isolated islands, they tend to be kind of the last reserve for um, groups that are getting, for whatever reason, overran on the mainland or overran on the plains. And because these areas tend to be so hard to reach, um, groups, languages, cultures, and unique, um, you know, morphological types of people, just unique societies tend to survive in those reclusive and hard to reach places. Caucasus is one of those islands of, um, you know, older, very, very deep rooted in ancient cultures, languages, and customs. And it's a fascinating place. Now, Caucasian languages, some of them have very interesting set of sounds in them that are not often found in a lot of other languages. And that's a very kind of, you know, throaty kind of almost rasping sounds. Uh, there's a lot of, um, Consonants, sorry, I forgot the word for a minute. Consonants in the Caucasian languages, sometimes you can have three, four, five of them in a row. So, and it's, and it's a very beautiful language. It sounds very, it's, it, throat is used a lot to modulate some of those sounds. And because um, Caucasus most likely was another location where some of these more are ancient populations, you know, more ancestral populations may have held out for longest. Um, it is, there's some suggestion that those particular sounds may have been picked up by the languages of Caucasus from the Neanderthal ancestors. Another language, this is not related to Neanderthals, but I'm sure you have heard of some of the African click languages, where some sounds are replaced by kind of sounds and other similar sounds. There's some also suggestion that those languages, which are also some of the oldest linguistic groups that exist on the planet today, and the people carrying those languages, have some of the most um, ancestral genes, you know, and uh, the greater diversity of genetics than people who live outside of those communities, which usually suggests, you know, the more diverse your genetic pool is, the more ancient your population is, because you have had the chance to evolve and diversify from one another. There's also some suggestion that those click sounds in those languages may be an ancestral um, language feature that either was picked up from the original Cro-Magnon languages or maybe from another, you know, species or close population of hominids and early humans who have lived in those areas, because scientists have found some trace evidence of another population, um, different from Cro-Magnons, different from the Neanderthals, different from the Denisovians, that also contributed to our modern human population, and particularly in Africa, which I think is fascinating to think that all these ancestors live in us still. And I just want to make a disclaimer that, you know, I'm very prejudiced against one culture, one culture in the world. You know, I don't, I'm fascinated by every culture, every tradition, every way of life. I think they're all very interesting languages and they just fascinate me. But there's one culture that I discriminate against and that I'm not very fond of. And that is the modern technological culture. You know, the modern technological society, wherever it may exist, whether it's, you know, in the United States, you know, in the Americas, whether it is in Europe, in Asia, whether it is anywhere else in the world. I'm just not a big fan of the modern technology that I'm using it. And um, other than that, I mean, I really don't have any objection. And certainly, 
embrace every cultural difference because the diversity is what gave the human species the flexibility and the ability to survive through all the climactic, uh, environmental, and self-inflicted trials and tribulations that humans have managed to get through so far, so far. Hopefully they will continue to do so, right? All right, so then we're gonna move on to music. You know, um, in 1995 in Slovenia, a flute was found. Uh, or it was called a flute at the time. And it was made out of a hollowed, well, basically like a hollowed out um, cave bear femur that has been pierced by spaced holes. And that, you know, when you actually used it as a flute, it would make sounds that were diatonic, or in other words, musically pleasing to the ear in nature. Now, it was originally hailed as an, a Neanderthal musical instrument because it was found in an area where only Neanderthals occupied at that time. There was no um, Cro-Magnons yet in that territory. And because it was, you know, clearly usable as an actual musical instrument. And then the reasons why, you know, it was identified as a flute is because it had perfect hole spacing and alignment. The whole shape was perfect round and it had the diatonic scale. It made the music scale notes. Now, more recent scientists have um, chosen to debunk that particular suggestion. And uh, they claim that a hyena was gnawing on that bone and it managed to accidentally make perfectly round holes. And because it was a very musically talented hyena, it was able to make those holes just perfectly to make notes pleasing to the human ear. Now, this is Marvine's joke. I'm stealing it shamelessly, but um, I think it's a good joke. And I find this desire by the scientists to debunk any chances that Neanderthals were like modern humans, very fascinating in of itself. It's, it's an interesting anthropological study as to why is it we're so, we're so eager to distance ourselves from this creature that was clearly our ancestor. I don't see any reason to call it anything but a flute. If it looks like a flute and it sings like a flute and it quacks like a flute, it's a darn flute. But that's a personal opinion. I guess studies will show. As far as the art goes, we clearly, as we discussed before, we know that Neanderthals had art. Now, there's no cave art that's clearly attributed to Neanderthals. There are, there are some places, some um, his, you know, cave art sites that are still being hotly debated as to whether it was the modern, um, well, the Cro-Magnons or the anatomically modern humans who have left those uh, cave paintings, or whether it was actually Neanderthals. The sites, the, some of the sites that are debated, they're very interesting. They are not the beautiful cave paintings that we're going to discuss in our next episode. They're more abstract, you know, they're dots, they're lines and squiggles, they're some partial handprints. And if they're images of animals, they're very different kinds of images of animals. As It's as if the animal has been almost taken apart. It's fairly unusual for a modern person to look at. But those are still being debated. We don't have any clear proof that Neanderthals actually used, um, you know, the ochre and other mineral paints to, in order to, mineral and organic paints in order to pro produce the kind of cave art that we're used to. But they have found in Spain and cave of uh, Los Avo, I cannot pronounce this, Avions, Los Avions. They found some ochre and paint containers that were made out of seashells that is, you know, as actually referred to as makeup containers. I don't know why. But there was definitely, you know, Neanderthals had some sort of container that they found that they put um, the ochre into and that they were using this pigment for some purpose. Now, ochre can be used for a number of reasons. It can be used to um, even modern people in Siberia and Africa. They will use this mineral to cover their hair and cover their faces because it tends to chase away parasites, blood-sucking insects. It's also used to soften and to cure, basically to prevent from rotting um, animal hides. So it's often used to that purpose. There's good reason to believe that the Neanderthals may have used this, um, you know, pigment in order to decorate their bodies with it. Again, I mean, obviously we have no proof of it, but when you use a pigment frequently in order to put it on your body anyway for hygienic reasons, it's not a very far-fetched jump from there to think of then using that pigment for other purposes, such as for, you know, signaling between groups as far as status, you're belonging to a particular group, claiming your territory, and so forth. It's definitely very widely used even with modern populations of uh, hunter-gatherers. Jewelry, they definitely made jewelry. There was a site where they, they meaning the archaeologists, of course, where the archaeologists have found some jewelry um, shells that were used for decoration. And for a while, there was a debate whether or not it's, and because 
the time period when this jewelry was produced was a time period where the cro magnets have already come into the neighboring areas. There was some debate whether or not this was something that Neanderthals actually picked up from the cro magnet neighbors, whether they stole the technology, the idea, or they physically stole the jewelry was debated. And so some analysis was done on the way that this jewelry was manufactured. And it turned out that the method of actually making the jewelry was vastly different from what the cro magnets were using. So this is clearly unique Neanderthal um, process for making shells into jewelry. And there are other, you know, basically cases of uh, Neanderthals using various items for, for decoration, or at least we think that's what they use them for. Again, I think if it's, you know, if it barks like a dog and it walks like a dog, it's a darn dog. But, so some of those examples, they found some remains of birds of prey, such as eagles and falcons, where, um, for example, their talons were cut off and the rest of the you know, bird was not eaten or utilized in any other way at all. And the talons were mod modified in such a way as to where they could be attached to things, you know, they could be worn as jewelry or attached to clothing to decorate the clothing. And uh, basically, I mean, there's no other reason you would catch a bird of prey, which is a very uh, time consuming, very kind of dangerous and just energy inefficient enterprise, really, and just in order to cut off its talents, unless those talents had some sort of social meaning, some sort of status meaning, some sort of semantic meaning within your culture. And again, with the birds of prey, you know, in Croatia and in Spain, um, there are places uh, where they've found basically bird carcasses where the bird again was untouched for any sort of culinary purpose, but just the flight feathers of this bird of prey, which are very large, they're very beautiful, were cut off. Clearly, you can see the cut marks on the remains of the birds and were likely used for decoration purposes because we know even from modern cultures that feathers is something that's often used as a part of a costume of us for some sort of other decorative purposes. I mean, the only other use for a large sturdy feather that I can think of really would be to use it as a brush, but a feather is, if you've ever handled a feather, you know that it does not do so well after you handle it a few times, it becomes frayed and completely useless. So to go out and catch these hard to get and rare birds and dangerous birds, just for the sake of using their feathers as a brush, it's possible. In Crimea, which, Let's not debate who's, which country it belongs to, but it found some raven bones. And they actually found 17 individual objects of these raven bones, you know, and these date to 43 to 38 uh, southern years. And these uh, raven bones had actually patterns um, scratched into them, and they all were decorated in this manner. So it's obvious that these bones, uh, these bird bones were used specifically. And again, raven is not a kind of bird that you usually eat. Ravens are not known for their culinary um, usefulness. But um, these bones were obviously used as some sort of decoration. So we know that Neanderthals made jewelry and um, we know that they had, uh, you know, possibly had music. Um, and we know that they possibly decorated or even as I've mentioned in the previous podcast, they may have tattooed themselves. Um, we also know that Neanderthals had religion. Now that's something that's again very hotly debated by the scientists today. It's been debated from the day that the subject was raised, but I believe that the evidence, the actual archaeological evidence that we have leaves no doubt that these were people who had some sort of a worship, who believed in some sort of a higher power. I mean, very first fact is the fact that they buried their dead. They buried their dead not only in the sanitary burials, but they have buried their dead in poses that were very reminiscent of sleep. And I'm sure you all know that uh, association of the idea of sleep and death, I mean, it's been associated in human cultures throughout history. And there has been some argument that they did not leave any kind of uh, grave goods, that they did not bury any items with their dead, but that's not true also. There have been several finds where it is either proven or it is hotly debated and highly likely if you use the Occam's razor principle that actually the items that were found next to the bodies, next to the remains of Neanderthals who were buried by their um, you know, contemporaries, potentially their family members, that they were actually grave goods. For example, um, in Iraq, um, 1975 find was a, a burial of um, an individual who was completely covered in flowers. And it's the uh, famous flower burial and the amount of flowers that this individual had piled up on their grave. It was an enormous pile. It was just an enormous pile of plants, flowering plants uh, that were actually all had medicinal properties. So we know that these plants today are used for, you know, by 
local native cultures to treat various kinds of ailments. And this was obviously in spring, and the people have, would have had to go out and put forth a considerable amount of effort to gather these flowering plants from all the surrounding areas and actually bury this individual with uh, the plants, uh, with the flowers that were medicinal. Now there has been some speculation that this may have been a shaman or this may have been some sort of a healer and that this was a way of, you know, for the tribe, for the surrounding communities to honor a knowledgeable person or, you know, a wise person in their tribe. Um, Counter argument has been put forth that the pollen, because the reason we know this individual was buried covered in flowers is because there was pollen remnants on the grave, fossilized po uh, pollen. And uh, there has been some counter argument that the pollen has been dragged there by rats or groundhogs or some sort of similar animals or birds. You know, I think that that's highly unlikely. I mean, for that amount of pollen to be concentrated and specifically in the site of a burial, again, it stands to reason that it was placed there purposefully. Um, another, um, you know, sign of uh, Neanderthal art and also Neanderthal architecture. And we know that Neanderthals were capable of construction. We know that they built dwellings. We know that they were able um, to build uh, basically uh, windbreak walls. And uh, in some cases, they actually built kind of uh, niched enclosures for certain artifacts. But another, you know, clear evidence of construction is um, uh, a cave in France Brinequel cave where, you know, basically there's ring structures that are built inside the cave and it's not a cave where Neanderthals actually lived. It is a cave that they went into for some sort of purpose. I would argue and a lot of people would argue ritual purpose, uh, but they took stalagmites and they, uh, pieces of stalagmites and they arranged them into circles and spirals uh, for no specific a reason, you know, utilitarian reason that anybody can suggest. So this is, was obviously an abstract reason. It was a, some sort of symbolic reason, most like the religious one. Of course, very well known is the cave bear cult um, idea, um, where in several locations, one of them would be a Drakenlock, famous Drakenlock in Switzerland, where cave bear um, skulls were separately placed into the niches that were made in the wall or were made, you know, inside the cave and they were arranged in a certain way. People have tried to deny the fact that this was done purposefully because I mean, when you have separated heads of an animal and an animal such as a bear, which is a very enigmatic animal in modern cultures, well, relatively modern cultures, it is often associated with the, um, to, you know, kind of the idea of totemism where you believe that your tribe, your people have, uh, not only spiritual, but actual ancestral relationship with a specific um, animal that you hold in high regard. And bear cults are very prevalent throughout human history. Slavic, early Slavic and Germanic tribes um, are known to have, um, to this day, actually, in some villages it is practiced, um, the idea that the bear is a very, bear is kind of the keeper of the forest. Bear is the counterpart to the humans. Bears eat the same things that humans eat. They're omnivores. They're the only animals in the North that look a lot like humans, especially when they stand up, at least the modern bears do this. There's some argument that the cave bears were actually not able to stand up on their hind legs. But um, bottom line is, I mean, the cult of the bear head, the cult of the bear, of the bear paw is very well known throughout human history. I know who the native population of, the, of Japan who lived there before, you know, people that we know as Japanese today migrated there. They, to this day, in, on the island of Sakhalin, which is on Russian territory, they practice uh, the bear cult uh, where they, you know, if you accidentally kill a bear that you don't intend to kill in the forest, you have to bury it with certain respect because it is an ancestral, ancestral, ancestrally linked to your particular tribe, to your community. Or they can, you know, they have practices where they will take a baby bear from the woods and they will bring it up in absolute love and care and plentitude to a certain age and then they will ritually sacrifice it with much respect and honor and then, you know, uh, kind of perform certain funerary rites over this bear because they're sending this bear was a message to their ancestors. So bear cult is something that is very, very important throughout human history. And so in this cave, you know, they found these bear heads that were separated from the bodies. There was no sign that they have been butchered or eaten. There was just the skulls that were placed in neat rows in their little ninjas. All kinds of um, attempts to debunk this fact and the fact that it was purposefully done by the Neanderthals have been attempted. 
Marvine tells a story about a particular um, publication that he has read a while back where somebody suggested that a pack of bears, pack of cave bears, because you know, cave bears, they're pack animals, right? So a pack of bears was hunting in the mountains and long behold came a flash flood. And this, this flash flood was so violent that it managed to tear off all these pack, pack bears' heads clean off, strip them all, of all the flesh and then neatly place them into ninjas that it had conveniently made, you know, in the walls of the cave. I mean, this is a theory that is likely as the whole idea of a very musically talented hyena. Um, and I think that this is exactly what it looks like. It's either totem cult or some sort, sort of a basically religious practice. Otherwise, there's no reason why Neanderthals would separate the heads and place them in such neat order. And this is not the only find related to the cave bear and uh, the Neanderthals. Um, in uh, Re uh, Reguram, France, a row of cave bear skulls was found facing the cave entrance in a half circle as if they were looking out of the cave. And again, this is a cave where there's no sign of actual activities. There's no sign of butchering. There's just these, you know, skulls that are placed in a half circle with obvious meaning. So I think that all of this is fairly good indication that um, Neanderthals definitely had some sort of uh, worship. And then uh, last find uh, that has to do with the funerary practices is uh, uh, Teshik Tash, and that was found in 1938 in Central Asia, a former USSR. Um, and it was a burial in a shallow pit of a youth, um, of a boy most likely who actually was attacked by a bear to, to where half his face and his shoulder had been ripped out. And he was buried in such a way where red ochre was placed over the site of the wound. And he was buried with some grave goods. Um, and again, we go back to the subject of Neanderthals not ever placing grave goods into their burials. Well, there have been several finds where that, that has clearly been proven to not be true. So this um, you know, youth was buried with uh, horn cores that were placed around his head. I mean, um, and you know, actually Siberian ibex horns were placed almost like a fence around the grave. So obviously this was an individual who has died, who was greatly honored, who had some sort of items inventory put into his grave and also had a kind of an enclosure built for his grave. And the grave was obviously tended by either his relatives or his tribe. We don't know what this individual's um, status was within the tribe or the group, but it was in, clearly an individual who was greatly mourned and uh, you know some significance was put and some effort was put forth towards this individual's burial. Okay. Let me scroll down just a little bit and we're going to do some more interesting stuff. Mythology. So we're getting into the very speculative uh, stuff. And this is where I'm using the material from the Russian scientist, um, Yuri Biruskin. And Biruskin, he is actually an archaeologist, but he is an archaeologist who has, um, in the past years, begun compiling a database of human mythology. And, you know, when you think about mythology, you kind of think about these stories from the Greeks, um, about Zeus and all that, you know, the stories from the Scandinavian, you know, sagas. The mythology we're talking about here is not this kind of mythology. I mean, what he does, what Beruskin does is he takes, you know, stories, mythological stories from every part of the world, and he deconstructs them to very basic snippets, to kind of almost like memes that are inside the story. For example, you know, did, I don't know, did the eclipse eat the moon or eat the sun? So you have a short snippet, you know, the eclipse is basically portrayed as darkness swallowing the sun, for example. Or another myth, uh, you know, mythos like that is uh, the one about the diving animal. So this is one about how the earth was created, how the land was created. And this story tells about you know, that there was only water all around and then some sort of an animal. And in different cultures, it's a different kind of animal. It can be a duck. It can be some sort of a small, you know, it could be a ferret. It can be any kind of, it could, could, can be coyote for, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the actor is. What matters is just the action and the very short kind of basically condensed version of the story. And so this animal dives, you know, to the bottom of the sea and it like, well, an otter or, um, you know, a seal dives to the very bottom of the sea, it grabs a, you know, small amount of the, of the earth from beneath the sea and it brings it up to the surface. And that's how basically our continents are made or, you know, this solid ground is made. That, those are kind of the methods that um, are been put into this database. And Beryoskin has been compiling this database for several years. It's a unique database in the world. Um, 
and he has been having correspondence from all around the world, uh, sent him various mythos from all around the world's cultures. And he, what him and his assistant have been, you know, his colleague have been doing, his, uh, the person that he works with, they have been in putting these little mems into a database. And then they were they've been plotting this database on the actual map. And it's pretty awesome. We will talk more about it when we get to the mythological motifs in human history. But if you look at the way that these um, markers are plotted on actual map, you can see, you can roughly date when the mythos has originated and you can follow how it has progressed across the map. So when you plot it on the map, you see two migrations coming out of Africa. One migration, uh, it goes along the, basically the shoreline, it comes out of Africa. You know, they have very little data for the Middle East because Middle East population has been replaced so many times. There's very little trace left of any sort of mythology in that region. But then it skips over, you know, Middle East and it winds up, uh, you know, in India and China. And it continues along, you know, the warmer kind of zone and climates across the islands and eventually winds up in the South America. So, you know, what is supposed from that migration from that particular plot line is that it's likely that there was a, you know, first wave into Americas that, you know, made it up possibly through the Bering uh, as well as the second wave, but it was pushed by the later migration wave all the way to the far south end of the Americans, of the Americas together. And that, so in the Americas, South Americas mythology, it matches the mythology that still exists in Africa. Now, so all of this, you know, this whole region, like I said, it comes out of Africa, skips Middle East, goes through India, parts of China, you know, Siberia, it goes through the islands, it binds up in South America. They all match each other. And this is a mythology um, that has, for example, things like um, rainbow. All of those cultures, you know, in our culture, rainbow is a very positive thing, right? I mean, we think about leprechauns, with, you know, we've tried to make a wish on it. You know, um, the LGBT movement uses it as a symbol. But in those cultures, rainbow is actually considered to be a snake. There's actually a lot of snake uh, references in a lot of those mytho mythos. Um, but the rainbow is considered to be a foul sky snake, and it's something that's scary, something that's stinky, something that's very foul, and you need to hide your children from it. You need to run and hide indoors from it because it will curse you. So it's a very negative view of the rainbow. Now, the second migration that came out of Africa, um, it went more along the northern territories. You know, it uh, basically through Europe, um, all the parts of Asia, and then wound up in Americas as well, but it wound up mostly in the Northern America in that second, you know, migration wave. And so that second wave is associated with a whole different set of mythos, um, of myth mythology. And again, for example, rainbow is a very, and you can very clearly see how this is distributed on the map, just it's, it's a statistical mathematical equation. Um, so, the idea is that, you know, that, so here's the way that uh, Beroskin explains the separation. Uh, why is it um, that the mythology in the northern um, regions in Europe and Asia, you know, parts of Asia and Siberia is so different from the rest of the world? And his suggestion is that, um, you know, the people who have encountered those much colder, harsher climates, they had to adapt to a whole new environment. They've lost a lot of their population in a bottleneck lost a lot of older mythology, you know, people who just knew all the mythology and so kind of had to reinvent mythology from scratch. I mean, and this is not just the rainbow story. I mean, this has to do with the idea of, for example, why, you know, the, one of the very first mythological motifs that's found in this study is why do people die? That's something that people really obviously were curious about. The second motif is how did people come to be? I mean, where did people come from? And so on, as all like for example, when did man and a woman become separate from each other? Those kind of things, and uh, those are obviously subjects that in human populations have been thinking about, debating about, um, wondering about since really they first became aware of themselves. But um, so what Beroskin suggests as an explanation for that is this fact that they encountered a whole new environment, lost a lot of their members, and uh, had to invent a brand new set of mythology from scratch. I personally propose a new different explanation. I believe that that drastic change of very different ideas in mythology that suddenly appeared in the human population, you know, in the Northern human population that happens to match the Neanderthal range, possibly was borrowed and transmitted from the Neanderthal population to the Cro-Magnon population that encountered the Neanderthals 
I think that Neanderthals who have been living in the territory for much longer than the Cro-Magnons who were more or less newcomers knew a lot about the land, they knew a lot about the animals, they knew a lot about medicinal plants, and that the Cro-Magnons, you know, after the original conflict that most likely took place, had a lot to learn from their Neanderthal counterparts. And when you have two cultures coexisting, not even intermingling, but just coexisting side by side, we see that in modern ethnographical studies, the transmission of the, you know, the mythology of the fairy tales of the folklore is very prominent. I mean, the folklore will migrate and mutate as it encounters new social groups and new societies and even new environmental factors. So you, for example, I don't know, a swan might become an otter or a duck might become a deer, but the basic kind of that snippet of, you know, the action that is at the core of the mythos, it remains. And so, you know, those two societies, Neanderthal and cro societies that have lived side by side, as I've mentioned in the previous podcast, in Palestine, they lived literally for thousands of years side by side and actually formed an intermixed hybrid population. I believe that there's a very high possibility that mythology was transmitted from one society to the other. And I think that one of the potential, again, this cannot be proved by any scientific means that I'm aware of, but I think there's a good chance that that mythology may have um, kind of impacted and affected the cro the modern human mythology in that part of the world where they encountered the Neanderthals. And there's a couple more interesting things about mythology. You know, you, we've talked about those isolated places where groups of um, ancient ar archaic cultures, archaic not in the sense of their capability, but archaic in the sense of their heritage, you know, to have very deep roots, have managed to survive. And one of those isolates um, is the Basque language and the Basque people who live, um, you know, in the, um, that region between Italy and Spain. And the Basques, they are some of the most ancient people in the world as far as their language and their genetics go. There's some belief that they might be uh, descended from the original Paleo-Europeans, the population that lived in Europe before the Aryans managed to invade Europe and take over most of its territory. And uh, the Basques um, have preserved some of their oldest um, you know, folklore, or some of the oldest tales of uh, current European populations. And one of their legends that the Basques tell still to this day is a legend about people who lived in that region before them who were very different from them and who knew the region much better than them, who have taught them everything that they know, you know, who have taught them how to utilize the land, the animals, who had more culture than they did when they came to the region. Now, this is a very far-fetched guess, but it's interesting to think whether or not that might be an echo, some sort of a memory of... Um, potentially encounters with some sort of isolate human groups that they encountered who were already living on the land and who were more deeply rooted, you know, who predated the actual Paleo-Europeans. Another interesting st topic that's brought up when it's, you know, talked about Neanderthals as being something that's imprinted in modern human kind of mind is the talk about the trolls in Scandinavian um, mythology. Trolls in Scandinavia, and that's debatable because on the one hand, trolls are very recent um, addition to the Scandinavian myth. I mean, to basically trolls as a concept is something that's more or less modern in the way that we think of them now as the big burly creatures. But trolls as an idea of a kind of a wild man, especially wild woman in Scandinavian uh, and uh, you know even Germanic folklore is fairly ancient. And there is some possibility that maybe, just maybe those ideas of trolls of um, you know gnomes of people who look different than humans and are kind of human, but not identical to them. The other humanities may actually be something that is a, a reminiscent, a bit of reminiscing about the time when we humans have shared this planet with other species of humans, so like us and yet so different from us. So modern European languages, they all um, Indo-Aryan languages, they belong to the Indo-Aryan language group. But before them, there was a population living in Europe, and some of remnants of that population may have survived in harder to reach places. One such remnant that we know of are the Picts, which is a very interesting people that Romans have encountered and fought against. The Picts became the kind of the substrate, um, one half of what we know today is the Scottish people. Um, the other half of that substrate are the people from the actual island of Ireland. And Ireland was also another place that was isolated from the mainland. And I believe that it is a place where a paleo um, population may have survived. Now, with the Irish people, we have, with the population that occupied Ireland at that time, 
we have a very unique morphological type that you do not really see anywhere else in the world. You know, among humans everywhere around the world, things like lighter colored eyes, especially blue eyes, is fairly common. Lighter colored hair, <clears throat> blonde, or even red hair is something that is fairly common. I mean, you even see it in Papua New Guinea, you see it in Africa, you see it in a lot of places. But um, the combination of green eyes, really pale freckled skin and red hair is something that is fairly unique to that region. And it is something that has been discovered, at least early genetic studies on Neanderthals have suggested that they have possibly had those traits as well. It could have been a, ca a case of co-evolution to where, you know, two different species evolve similar traits just because they reside in the same kind of area. But it is possible that it is a genetic, rem this is purely, again, my speculation, that it is a genetic remnant from those, you know, archaic populations that may have been secluded on those hard to reach regions of the world. And the thing that speaks, I think, in favor of my very unprovable theory is the fact that throughout, you know, European history, redheads in general uh, have been, even to this day, you know, redheads are called gingers. They are teased, they picked on in school. There has been a general subject of redheads being wizards, them being witches, of them being magicians, of them having some sort of other earthly powers. There's, you know, redheads in culture have always been treated as the others, as different from us, and been heavily discriminated against even in, you know, more recent Christian history. And I think that might be a trace memory of the fact that they belong to a different population than the mainland Europeans did. And the final thing that I want to get to is a very debatable subject, and that is the subject of autism. I've talked to people who study autism. I've also talked to people who are themselves diagnosably autistic. And there has been some suggestion that because Neanderthal brain structure was slightly physiologically different from the modern human brain structure to where humans have, their brain tends, like homo sapiens sapiens, they tend to have their brain kind of front lobe heavy to where, you know, Homo neanderthalis sapiens, uh, their brain were kind of shifted towards the back of their head. And there was, there's some suggestion that that, even though they had larger brains that affected their mental capacity, I think that's highly debatable as far as them being not as smart as, uh, you know, cro -Magnons. Because even um, humans very recently practice and have practiced such a thing as deformation of the head of the babies. And that's when a mother takes a newborn child whose skull is still soft and kind of malleable. And she gently and slowly shapes it either by use of outside objects or by using just her own hands very delicately. She shapes it into a certain kind of shape that is more noble, more prestigious in the society that she lives in. And people with those kind of you know, differently shaped skulls, they grow up with heads that are shaped differently, and yet their mental capacity is not diminished in any sort of way. But I do think it's possible that there were some differences in the fine details of the brain structure between Neanderthals and uh, cro -Magnons. And it has been suggested that possibly autism, which affects the modern human population oftentimes in a negative way, though not always, uh, that autism might have been more pre prevalent and more normal, more natural in the Neanderthal population. And it may be a trait that modern humans have partially um, obtained from the intermixing with their Neanderthal ancestors. Now that is a ho hotly debated subject. It's not something that has been proven in this point in time, but again, it's something that I have heard in private conversation from both uh, people who study autism and people who themselves uh, have you know, been exposed to autism or been diagnosed with autism in one way or another. And I don't think it's highly unlikely. I think that the possibility that the Neanderthals had more intuitive, more slightly differently structured um, way of thinking is highly possible. And that for them, you know, these qualities that, uh, you know, we diagnose as autism in our population today may have not been disadvantageous. They may have actually been advantageous and they're more isolated more sensory depri deprived kind of environments where they existed in smaller social groups. And as far as the last stand of the Neanderthals, you know, it's been talked about quite a bit. It's been in the movies, uh, Gibraltar, um, and that's a British overseas territory where for a while it was hailed that this was the actual last place where Neanderthals lived on earth. We don't know if it was the last place or not. It was definitely a place where isolated group of Neanderthals who obviously were racist Neanderthals and did not wish to mix with their Cro-Magnon neighbors, most likely did kind of live out their last stand and slowly pretty much died away because all around them, there, there were potential mating partners that they were just not willing to communicate with, be tolerant towards, and, you know, intermarry with. 
And I think that's a lesson to us all. We should be more tolerant of our neighbor and appreciate the diversity that we have in this world and take our opportunity to diversify our genetic pool and find fitting mates for ourselves if we are lacking those around us immediately. I think that's all for episode three. And I think I finally did it. This is my third take on it. And oh my gosh, I'm so happy it's done. Um, episode uh, four, two days from now, Thursday as usual. And if you want to join me, just go ahead and leave a comment or contact me if you know how to contact me. Um, I'm going to leave all the links for this podcast below it as usual. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. that exist within every man's soul every man's and we soul. will live forever or as long as stories are told, stories are told. Stories we are, are the told. archetypes that exist within every man's soul